In the last session, we discussed how Newton arrived at his inverse square law of gravitation. In order to do so, however, the Newton had to make an approximation for the time interval being sufficiently small. Now, how small is small? Or, when do you say a given time interval is sufficiently small? To find answers to these questions, Newton ended up inventing calculus. In today's session, we are going to begin with the discussion on the methods of calculus. We shall be following the modern notation, which is largely due to the work of Leibniz. You may know that Newton and Leibniz had a bitter fight as both of them had claimed to have invented the calculus for the first time. Let us now begin by defining a function. A function f is a map or relation from a set called the domain of the function, say capital X, to another set called the range of the function, say capital Y, such that for every X belongs to the set capital X, there is only one Y which belongs to the set capital Y. In other words, if there is element in the set X, which we also denote by a little x, then corresponding to this value, the function f will give you on only one value in the set y as you see in the schematic diagram and we denote that value in the set y by f of x. Now let us take an example. Say y equal to f of x equal to x square. Now if x are allowed to be any real numbers then the y where the function is constructed will only be the set of positive real numbers. For example, if you put x equal to 2, you would get y equal to 4. If you put x equal to 3, you will get y equal to 9. Clearly, the domain of the function f is the set of all real numbers. On the other hand, the range of the function f is the set of positive real numbers. Here the function f is read as fx is a real valued function over a real number x. Let me take another example y equal to fx equal to sin x for real x. Here domain of the function f is the set of real numbers r. On the other hand Given sin x takes values between minus 1 to plus 1, the range of the function fx here is the closed set minus 1 to 1. Here the set includes both the endpoints that is minus 1 and 1. Let me consider another example f of x equal to square root of x. So here clearly domain of the function f is the set of positive real numbers that is r plus and the range of the function is also a set of positive real numbers. Note that we can define another function let's say g of x which is the negative square root that is g of x equal to minus of root x. So the domain of the function g is r plus however the range of the function g is r minus or set of negative real numbers. So let me make this point clear here that for square roots of a number s a x, you have got two roots, one plus and the minus. So as you see it here, you should be considering positive root and negative root at two different functions because a function must give only one value as an output or a given value of an input say x. Okay, let me consider another example f of x equal to e to the power i x. Using Euler's formula you can also write it as cosine x plus i sine x where i is the imaginary number given by square root of minus 1. Here domain of the function f can be taken to be 
set of real numbers as given here. On the other hand, the range of the function f is a set of complex number and this is an example where f of x is a complex valued function over real numbers. Now we are ready to define more complicated functions. So here we define the so-called piecewise function. A piecewise function is a set of multiple functions defined over non-intersecting subdomains. So let me consider an example function. Let's say f of x equal to x for x being between 0 and 1 and 1 if x is greater than or equal to 1. So you can see this is basically a set of two function each function having its own domain and the domains are non-intersecting and you can see the graph that which part of the function belongs to which domain. Now we're going to define an important concept of a limit of a function. The limiting value of a function f of x as x approaches x0 but x0 equal to x0 is said to be L and is denoted as limit x goes to x0 f of x equal to L if for every small positive number delta there exists a number epsilon such that modulus of f of x minus L is less than delta whenever x minus x0 mod of it lies between 0 and epsilon. Now we can define left hand limit of a function as well as right hand limit of a function. As you see it here, if x0 plus is greater than x0, then we call the limit to be right hand limit. On the other hand, if we have a point x0 minus which is less than x0, then the limit is called left hand limit. Limit of fx is said to exist if left hand limit and the right hand limit of a function agree to each other. Let us now recall the example that we considered earlier. Here you can see that the right hand limit of the function f of x at the point 0 plus is actually 0. On the other hand, the left hand limit of the function at x equal to 0 minus is undefined because if you look at the function, the function definition does not include the point 0 minus. On the other hand, if you look at the point x equal to 1, the left hand limit that is x goes to 1 minus is equal to 1. On the other hand, even the right hand limit of the function is equal to 1. So at x equal to 1, you can say the function has a limit. On the other hand, at x equal to 0, the function doesn't have the limit because it is not defined. Let us now consider the so-called floor function. Floor function is the greatest integer less than or equal to x. So we can actually plot the floor function as you see it here, that between 0 and 1, the function will take value 0 excluding the point 1. So the open circle means the point uh, is not included and the closed shaded circle means the point is included. So as you can see that consider the point 1 then the left hand limit of the func floor function is 0. On the other hand the right hand limit of the floor function at x equal to 1 plus is 1. Therefore, at x equal to 1, the limit of the floor function does not exist. Let me emphasize this point that the limit x goes to 0 does not mean x equal to 0. In order to appreciate this, let us consider this equation at x equal to 0 through x equal to 0 which is equal to 4x. However, x being 0, you are not allowed to divide both sides by x. Otherwise, you would end up proving rather incorrectly 3 equal to 4 as you see it here. 
On the other hand, in the limit x goes to 0, an equation ax equal to bx implies a equal to b as now you are allowed to divide both sides by x given x is not equal to 0. I hope you have enjoyed today's session. In case you have any question, comment or suggestion, please feel free to write them below in the comment section. And if you like to follow the physics discussion here, then you are welcome to subscribe to this channel.